what I learned through my journey is that I was not as good as I thought I was, and they were not as evil as I thought they were. In high conflict, any intuitive, common sense thing you do to try to fix it will probably make it worse. Join our nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives on Village Squarecast for civil discussions about politics, religion, and race. The topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Find us on Village Squarecast wherever you get your podcasts. From the McCourney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. This week, we are talking with Thomas Maine, who is the author of the book, The Rise of Illiberalism, uh, just published by Brookings Press. And as we dig into the foundations that underlie liberalism and illiberalism, we really, I think, need to go to the Declaration of Independence. And we, we talk a lot on this show and have talked a lot about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers and those types of things. But I don't think we've really spent much time on the Declaration over the course of the time we've been doing the show. The Declaration is long, and really, the bulk of the document is laying out these grievances against uh, King George. But the first you know, two, three paragraphs are pretty important. They basically set the foundation for American government. And um, he says the issue is illiberalism. So if you're going to, you know, that's a negative definition. So you have to know what liberalism is. And so the best way to do that is to go back to the source that he goes back to, which is the the Declaration. Chris, uh, you're right that much of the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances. I often think of it as, uh, or at least it reminds me of celebrations of Festivus and the area of grievances. <laughs> and the, uh, I don't think Jefferson would appreciate that. <laughs> no, they, they were watching Carousel. <laughs> well, maybe Seifeld read the read the Declaration of Independence, because it is quite a list of grievances, but yes. I don't want to focus on those. I think I think where we want to spend a little bit of time before Jenna's interview is on the basic Enlightenment principles that are laid out in the Declaration of Independence, because that's really, you know, it is, of course, a statement of the colonists' independence from the crown, but its language also draws heavily upon Locke, and other Enlightenment scholars in laying out very different sorts of foundations for building governments. And, uh, you know, a sort of Hobbesian notion of a Leviathan that can just overwhelm everything to a very different idea. And I think it's captured best in just the second paragraph. And this, of course, is the part of the Declaration of Independence that everybody knows best. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Chris, when you think about the Declaration of Independence and Enlightenment, what are you hearing in that particular paragraph. Well, it's, it's really, really dense, isn't it? And you're right. Every word is dense, right? Inalienable. I mean, I bet you most Americans have no idea what that means. But what, what that means is that because you have these rights and because they are given to you as a product of your humanity, you cannot, you cannot take, give them away and they cannot be taken from you. As a human being, you have them. So that is the foundation on which everything else kind of proceeds, right? And to say it's self-evident means, you know, if you understand the term hum- human being, if you understand what a human being is, you just understand that those rights are there. And so that is the ground for a democracy. Everything else follows from that. Yeah. If I, actually, if I, just to pick up on what you're saying, Chris, I, I actually say two truths are self-evident, right? The first truth that's self-evident is that all men are created equal. Mm-hmm. And then the second is that they are endowed with an unalienable rights. But, but then I, I want to go a step further on it because I think it's really important. And that is to say that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Now, I, I always read this as a really important development and foundational statement about democracy. And that is that the government is set up to protect your rights. Mm-hmm not to step on your rights, 
not to deny your rights, not even to develop those rights because they're on, because they are self-evident, but rather to protect those rights. Mm -hmm. And as long as those uh, rights are respected, then the, the people will give the government its consent. Once the government fails to do that, then the people, because that's the job of the government, if it fails to do that, not only do the people have the right, they even have the, you know, I mean, in some sense, the obligation to say no to this government and to come up with a different form. And so what I think is so interesting about Tom Maine's work uh, that we'll hear about shortly is that it picks up on this verse section mm -hmm. and, and is basically trying to argue that there's this political phenomenon in our country. And I'll, I'll let you draw out the argument a little bit more. And it's complex. Right. So there's all kinds of contention is part or it's, it's constitutive of democratic politics, of politics. People are going to disagree and they're going to fight about those disagreements. That's just democracy. But throughout American history, the, the vast preponderance of people have accepted the idea that uh, the, the kind of grounding principles of American democracy, not just that there is some kind of equality. And we can talk about what that means and we probably should. But the idea that there is some kind of fundamental political equality, the idea that there are fundamental human rights, electoral democracy, that people choose their governors, and but they remain sovereign, that there's a rule of law that applies to everyone. Right. And he's, he's doing this by drawing on the rhetoric, the actions, the beliefs of a wide range of groups that he's kind of grouping together, right, under this notion of illiberalism. So whether they be fascists or you know, neo-fascists or hardcore Nazis or the John Birch Society or just an anti-Semitic group of some kind, right, a racist group of some kind, he's bringing them all together under this general idea of illiberalism. I think that uh, you, both of you did, did a great job sort of laying out the, the framework for his arguments. And uh, let's go to the interview to hear some more. So here is the interview with Tom Maine. Thomas Maine, welcome to Democracy Works. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am happy to be here. <laughs> so excited to talk with you about your latest book, the rise of illiberalism. And I know you have sort of published along these lines before. Your last book was The Rise of the Alt-Right, which came out in 2018. Can you start us off by talking a little bit about how you got from that book to this new one? Yeah. Well, you know, I wrote The Rise of the Alt-Right after I had finished another big project and I was looking for something to do. And then I became aware, newly aware, of these radical, radically anti-democratic websites and movements. So I, I threw my, and, and at that time, that, that when I got interested in it, a lot of people, when I talked to them about my interest, they'd say, oh, this, no, no, it's such a small group of people, or oh, they're just slipping off, or they're, you know, uh, populist conservatives cool off. So I wrote The Rise of the Alt-Right to dot the size of the movement, which was considerable, and how radical it was. And then also I wanted to, to talk about what to do about the rise of what I call illiberalism, which is simply the uh, rejection of any or all of the principles of liberal democracy. So I decided, you know, a more comprehensive analysis of, you know, a deeper discussion of where these ideas came from. Right. Especially their ideas about identity and the problem with their ideas about identity. And then a discussion of what to do about the, the rise and the penetration of these illiberal ideologies. That's that's what I wanted to do in the rise of illiberalism. You, you used a couple words there that I think are sometimes used interchangeably in more popular media accounts of these topics. And that's illiberalism and populism. Can you yeah. walk us through similarities, differences, how we should think about each of those things? Okay. So first of all, illiberalism is, in my definition, it's extremely radical. It's an ideology, right, which explicitly steps forward and rejects one or more of the principles of liberal democracy. And what are the principles of liberal democracy? You know, 
They're summed up very nicely in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. So it's political egalitarianism, right? Everybody has a, the same political status, human rights, right? Electoral democracy, a just consent of the governed. It's the rule of law, okay? Nobody is above or outside of the rule. Of, and it's, uh, it's an ethics of controversy and a political culture that are based on tolerance and rational discussion. So that's illiberalism. And to reject any of those principles is extremely radical position. Now, populism is a, a rather different. I know I'm not sure I can put my finger on, on a definition of it. You know, it focuses, seems to me, mostly on appealing to one slice of the population. You know, in, in, in the United States of America, populism expresses itself as kind of a desire to protect and advance the interests of the, the white working class. Now, put that way, populism isn't, you know, it's neither here nor there. But what has, has happened is in the United States, populism has now become closely wedded with illiberalism and populism is much more problematic than it necessarily needs to be. Right. And um, you spend an entire chapter uh, in the book sort of taking a deep dive into the audience for illiberalism, looking at websites and blogs and, and other accounts that folks may gravitate toward. Can you just give us a, a sense of the size and then the scope of the sort of getting right. back to what you were saying earlier about this being more than just a fringe element out there? Yeah, this is a key element. I mean, and you can still see, you know, for instance, of some, some months ago, Tucker Carlson said, well, how large is the audience for white supremacism at the alt-right? Oh, it's so tiny, the number of people would fit into a football stadium. So I wanted to test that hypothesis. So, and also, you know, now here's a very important point. When you ask how big is a movement or how big is the uh, audience for an ideology, everything depends on compared to what, right? So if you say, oh, this website received 20 million visits per month, well, is that a lot or a little? Right. Well, you don't, you know, it all depends on what other websites are, are, are receiving. So what I did is I found a place, it's called Media Bias Fact Check, which sorts all sorts of websites ideologically, okay, from the right or, or right, let's say from the left, okay, which is, you know, mainstream traditional progressivism or liberalism, as it used to be called, through the, the, the left center, the center, the right center, and the right. OK, so they sorted hundreds of websites in that way. OK, so I had that. And then I put together a list of what I call illiberal right sites. OK, and, and how did I do that? Well, I went to sites that boldly stepped forward and said, hello there, we're all right. Or hello there, we're uh, neo-Nazi, you know, or, or otherwise specified their illiberal orientation. I went to those sites. I looked at the sites that those seed sites listed in their blog roles and links lists, okay? I collected catalogs of sites from places, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League. And uh, I went through them, I sorted through them, I pulled out what I thought were the sites that were truly illiberal. And uh, let's, so, so what, and, it's, and by the way, there's a right-wing illiberalism and there's a left-wing illiberalism. You know, left-wing illiberalism is things, communism, Maoism, anarchism, and so forth. Anyhow, so when you do this, uh, you end up with, I identified, I think it was 215 hardcore right-wing illiberal sites. And they had an audience. I, and, by, and by the way, you can buy data on web traffic to sites, which is what I did. So I just, I bought the data. And I discovered that for in the first 11 months of 2019, these hardcore right illiberal sites received on monthly average about 186 million visits per month. Well, is that a lot or a little? Well, it's about 30% the size of the audience for mainstream conservative sites like National Review and such places. It's about 30% the size of that audience. It's about 19% the size of the audience for mainstream sites like the New Republic and the Nation. 
So you have, from what you've described, spent more time on these sites in this world than certainly than I have, or that I'm going to guess many of our listeners have. Can yeah. you just talk a little bit more about what you saw, some, some of the, the takeaways from your time in this particular corner of the internet? Well, m- many of these sites are very, very rad. And, you know, no, we're not talking about your, you know, your grandfather's conservatism. No, we're not talking about conservatism that's, you know, similar to that of Ronald Reagan, but just a little bit uh, more crude. I, I mean, uh, let me, let me, let me give you some quotes from various sites. Okay. The notion that all men are created equal is nonsense. All right. That's the, from the American uh, Renaissance. Right. And which is a, which is a right, you know, a liberal right website. By the way, if you had to put your finger on a single concept that sums up the illiberal right, it's this idea that all people are not created equal. Okay. You know, Greg Johnson, who was the editor of Countercurrents Publishing, one of the most radical and uh, philosophical alt-right sites. He says, the true right rejects egalitarianism root and branch, okay? O- on electoral democracy, these sites reject electoral democracy. Zero Hedge, which is an, a liberal site that gets about 22 million visits a month on average. They say, democracy's pitting of individuals against each other leads to moral degeneration and impairs capital accumulation. Okay. And, you know, it would be easy to go on. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point here is this represents a very conscious understanding of the principles of liberal democracy and a very conscious rejection of them. So what changed? You just said, you know, this people have not always thought this way, or at least not as many people have always thought that way. What's different now that wasn't true 30, 40 years ago? Well, I I would say this. There was always on the right a an element. What back then it wasn't known as illiberalism. It wasn't known as the alt right. It was known as uh, right wing extremism. And this would be the things like the John Birch Society. There was a publication, the American Mercury, which was anti Semitic. Okay, and there were other fringe movements like that. But they had a relatively small audience. And Bill Buckley at National Review. What was succeeded in creating a platform for conservative ideas that rejected anti-Semitism, overt racism, explicit rejection of liberal democracy. And by the way, this isn't necessarily meant as a defense of the National Review. You can think whatever you want to about it, but it is clear that, for instance, you know, Buckley devoted an entire issue of the National Review to rejecting the Birchers. Okay. Now, Buckley could make this stick. And why is that? Because, hey, if somebody submitted a anti-Semitic article, you know, an overtly racist article, Buckley would just reject it. You know, so it didn't get into the pages of National Review. So what this means is that, and by the way, creating a digital platform is much less capital intensive than putting together a magazine, right? So now it's now it becomes cheap and easy for these fringe groups to reach a mass audience. And moreover, the platforms on digital media did not engage in the kind of gatekeeping that the editors of the old mainstream conservative magazines used to do. And that was much more difficult to do because it is very difficult to keep track of all the sites on the internet and say, okay, this one, this neo-Nazi site over here, we're taking it down. That's harder to do. So that's number one. But number two, it wasn't just a creation of digital media. Also, starting around 2000, there were a series of shocks to American politics, you know, starting with 9-11, Right. And then there was the second Iraq war. There was the financial meltdown of 2008. OK, there was, you know, immigration, which had been continuing for a long time in the United States from 65 on. Finally, people start to notice the dem- demographic changes that's having. And, you you know, you have the white working class feels correctly or that free trade policies and other policies have overlooked them. And also, you know, you have the election of a black president, which for you know some people was an enormous breakthrough and for other people was a deep shock. So anyhow, what happens is you have these shocks to the system convince at least a lot of people that, hey, you know, the old fashioned ideologies are not working anymore. 
it opens up a willingness. People become more receptive to, to new ideas. That's especially true on the right, because all of these, many of these shocks had on the watch of George W. Bush. And so it was mainstream conservatism that took a lot of hits. So the point is this, you had the shakeup, the apparent challenge of the mainstream political ideas, right? It happens on the watch of mainstream conservatives, right? You have the rise of digital media, right? And, and also you have the endurance of this small group of extremists. All that came together and the right-wing extremists now rechristened as the alt-right or a liberalism or whatever term you want to use, they finally managed to find an audience. You talked at the very beginning, one of the principles of liberalism, liberal democracy is you know, valuing electoral democracy, just consent of the governed and, and those types of things. Using that part of the frame, can you talk us through how you get from you know, what you've seen on illiberal websites and on these fringe media to the big lie and you know what we're seeing now in terms of the current crisis that American democracy yeah. is facing. I would say there's kind of a trickle down process. You know, in general, how do ideas? And by the way, I am firmly in the camp of political scientists who believe that ideas are an independent political resource, distinct from money, organization, votes. Okay, and ideas, the ability to step forward and say, hey. I know how to handle this problem and make a convincing argument for it. That's a source of power. Okay. So how do ideas have any impact at all on uh, policy and, and electoral politics? Well, these ideas get by experts, right, at very high levels of abstraction, you know, Nobel Prize winning economists and so forth. And then there's a whole kind of uh, process, right, whereby these ideas get simplified somewhat by intellectuals, right? They get tinkered with so that they apply to specific policy issues, right? They get picked up by the mass media and eventually ideas like, for example, the market-oriented sort of analysis that became so popular and so widespread in the 1980s, that was the result of this kind of trickle-down process. So you have something like that happening with this new set of, you know, I wouldn't call them intellectuals or experts. They're more like they're more like lumpen intellectuals and pseudo experts, right? But they're, they're they have these websites where they crank out their ideas, and you know, and, and some some of these people are uh, are people of uh, ability, however limited. They crank out the uh, the ideology, and then the ideology slowly gets watered down a little bit, right, and becomes easier to be disseminated. And you know, crucially, the most overt, explicit statements of a liberalism, like all people are not created equal, or, you know, really the white race is really the important race. Black lives really don't matter that much. Well, that's that sort of stuff is not suitable for dissemination on broadcaster cable TV. But however, very importantly, also associated with illiberalism is not only a set of ideas, but a distinct rhetorical strategy, right? Because one of the key principles of illiberalism is politics is war and adversaries are literal traitors, right? So if that's true, your rhetoric is going to be a rhetoric of, it's going to be a weaponized rhetoric. It's going to be a rhetoric that doesn't really seek to persuade anybody, but to attack. There's also, I think, a deeply rooted sense of identity here and, and what it means to be an American, to have an American identity. Yes. Can, you, can you talk more about that? So let's talk about different types of identity politics. Okay. First of all, one, one type of identity politics is the type of identity politics you see associated with, let's say, Black Lives Matter or with the mainstream feminist movement or with Latino groups. Okay. And, you know, these, these group, what, what you have, there's really nothing kind of new about this form of identity politics. If you read James Madison's Federalist 10, he talks about, he doesn't talk about interest groups, he talks about factions, right? And of course, it's well known that he celebrates the creation of factions at, because that, a pluralistic political environment like that, he thinks, makes for political liberty. 
And he talks about different types of factions. He talks about a manufacturing faction, a landed faction, a trading faction, an agricultural faction. And he talks a little bit about religious factions, but he doesn't talk about factions that are based in ethnicity or race or sex. Okay. So the rise of those sorts of factions is a relatively new phenomenon, right? And in principle is not, you know, if black people organize to advance their interests, if women organize to advance their interests, that's not fundamentally different from if manufacturers organize to advance their interests, for example. And so if you, if for instance, if you look at, go to Black Lives Matter's website, you will see, which says, you know, this is a very close paraphrase, we are un- unapologetically black, right? But however, in order to love other people, we must first love and care for ourselves. So there, so that's not an anti-white sentiment. That's simply saying, hey, we're one group amongst others. And, you know, uh, other groups, fine. You know, we eventually will, you know, we'll, we'll be, you know, we'll find a way to love them. But, you know, for the moment, what we want to do is get our own act together. So that kind of identity politics is really not terribly unproblematic. I mean, it's true that many people oppose the formation of a black and Hispanic and feminist groups, but in principle, it's all easily compatible with a liberal democracy. However, the identity politics of the alt-right is entirely different, right? It's, that's properly called identitarianism. It says, you know, first of all, my identity is entirely based on my race, Okay, and politics is entirely one of promoting the interests of my race at the expense of other races. Okay, and moreover, my race is superior to the other races and is locked in a zero sum combat with other races for political power. Right. So that kind of 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 identity politics, that's positively lethal to uh, liberal democracy. However, There is a form of identity politics, right, which uh, I think addresses some of the issues that motivate identitarians. Identitarians want to find some unifying factor that pulls the many interest groups, the many factions of a pluralistic politics together. And that in and of itself is not a bad ambition. What's what's bad is when you when you, you know, define that unifying force as race. Now, so is there such a unifying force? Is there an American identity? The answer turns out to be yes. And if you look at the empirical work that's been done by Deborah Schildkraut, she's done extremely important work where she polled Americans of all different backgrounds and races and ethnicities. And it turns out there is a set of ideas that the vast majority of Americans believe And that can be thought of as an American identity that kind of unifies everybody. And those ideas are, one, an embrace of the liberal tradition, right? Two, what Childekraut calls civic republicanism. This is the idea that, hey, Americans work in their communities. They join groups to make their communities better. That's kind of like the Tocquevillian sense of American activism. There is incorporationism, which celebrates what we now call diversity. And then, unfortunately, you know, there are there there is an element of culturalism, a.k.a. good old fashioned racism. A lot of Americans do believe that to be an American, you need to be white. So that's the id of American identity, which has to be balanced and combated by the other positive features of American identity. And so that gets us to the what do we do about it question. All right. First of all, I would say that you know one way to deal with the demographic changes and the changes wrought by globalization and free trade and the rise of groups blacks women achieving the levels of political power they haven't had before one way of dealing with that of trying to smooth the transition to a new american majority right is for intellectuals politicians to argue that these developments are essentially consistent with the American identity, right? You, you know, clearly the corporationist element of the American identity 
can obviously be put to good use to say, hey, listen, we've incorporated all sorts of groups into American politics, you know, including the ethnic groups that came over in the 19th century, early 20th century. Hey, we can do the same thing with rising new groups like Blacks, Latinos, and women. However, I also think structural reform is absolutely essential, okay? So a couple of things. First of all, it has to be admitted, the Constitution, one of the great creations, political creations of the human mind, you know, it's got certain features of it, like the Electoral College, okay, like equal representation in the Senate, all right, like the fact that there is no explicit right to vote in the Constitution. These things have to be dealt with, okay? And also the, you know, the, the Senate and quasi-constitutional provisions like the, the filibuster. So what we have to do is we have to work for to achieve a truly realigning election on the level of like 1964, that was the last time that you had a smashing electoral victory that produced majorities in both houses of Congress and control of enough state legislatures right, to make constitutional reform possible. So I, th I think constitutional reform is very uh, important. And I also think there has to be some reform in uh, internet regulation as things now stand, if a digital provi a provider allows someone to make uh, libelous or racist statements, right, then the, di the digital provider is held harmless in kind of the way that a bookseller is held harmless if he sells a book or she sells a book that contains libel. You can, su you can sue the publisher, you can sue the author, you can't sue the bookstore. So the problem with that is it gives the digital platforms no incentive to moderate themselves. And I think that things have to be changed so that the platforms like Google, like Facebook, et cetera, have more of an incentive to uh, moderate and edit themselves. So you know, you've just laid out a, a whole bunch of potential reforms there, both in terms of ideological or you know ideas and also structural reform. How optimistic are you about any of this coming to fruition anytime soon? I'm kind of a cockeyed optimist. I mean, my sense is that, you know, unlike other countries that have seen the rise of illiberal populism, right, I think democratic institutions and liberal ideas are just too deeply ingrained into American political culture, into the American identity, right? And I think that the, you, you know, the quality of ideas counts. You can say anything you want to about the, fr the free market neoliberal ideology that caught on in the 80s, right? But the intellectuals and the academics who advanced that, many of them, not all, you know, there were, there were plenty of hacks as there always are, but there were, there were some serious thinkers coming out of, for instance, the Chicago School of Economics, which I'm not necessarily endorsing. I'm simply saying that the, the level of thought, right, in that movement was pretty high. Well, the level of thought amongst right-wing liberals is pretty low, right? And so I think, you know, this, the kind of, this, the essential failure on simply on a purely intellectual plane of the illiberal movement and also the roots of liberalism understood now as, as liberal democracy, it's just too deep for there to be a fundamental overturning of liberal democracy in the United States. We may be in for a negative period, but I think we will organize and think our way out. Great. We will leave it there. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you so much, too. Jen, a terrific interview working and engaging interview to work through a complex book that takes on a lot of political theory. So really nice. I want to pick up on something that brings this whole thing into more contemporary times, as he does himself. Thinking about January 6th, thinking about some of what's come up after January 6th, well, what strikes me about contemporary illiberalism compared to some older illiberalism is the way that it's worked itself into one of the two major political parties. And I was really struck by a news story just this week that uh, had to do with Peter Thale. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The deal, but anyway. Deal, the uh, conservative billionaire tech guy, big supporter of Donald Trump. 
possibly one of the largest contributors to Republican candidates right now going into the 2022-2024 cycle. And what the article talked about is how Thiel is directing his money towards candidates who support the idea that the election uh, was stolen and to support the insurrectionists from January 6th. And as we talked about on previous shows, if you don't accept the peaceful transition of power, you're basically not accepting democracy. I mean, there's no two ways about that. There is, all of this kind of fits together, right? You know, he's talking about people giving up on, on democracy, giving up on the idea that everyone has the same rights, giving up on the idea that there is a standard of behavior and rhetoric that is appropriate for uh, a democracy and giving up on even rejection of violence. All of this is, is kind of combined in, in what we see as illiberalism right now. So right. he talks about the media as gatekeepers. And we've mm -hmm. also, you know, we've had on the author of, you know. of, right, of how democracies die, and they talk about party. Yeah, I wrote that down too. And, and what's so important here, I think, is how party gatekeepers on the right have basically said anything goes. Well, or, and, or and they've if lost that, their power to change it. Yeah, or they've, either they've acquiesced yeah. to it or they've lost any power to change it. Yes, but when you also elevate somebody like Theo as one of our major party donors, right? yet he is specifically giving money to those who try to overturn the election, mm -hmm. that is really bringing this illiberalism into the heart of the Republican Party. No, I think he. I think Tom would agree with that. I think. And, he would and, I mean, not to mention, is. not to mention Trump. Uh, well, of that's, course, who is like the walking embodiment, right, of illiberalism. Right. There are illiberal elements on the left, and insofar as they reject some of these core liberal principles, they are the same, but they are not remotely the same. <laughs> Any of these manifestations on the left are simply incidental compared to the role of these moments on the right. And this is, this is a quote I wrote down from the book that I think, you know, just says just that. If the penetration of illiberalism into American political culture is a matter of concern, the problem is to be found exclusively on our right flank. The illiberal left is minute, entirely isolated, and unengaged. The illiberal right is sizable, closely connected with mainstream political tendencies and dramatically more engaged with political discourse than any other ideological tendency. This is not something that he's just asserting. He's using this fairly sophisticated empirical analysis of websites and, and the kind of machinery by which these ideas get moved into the popular discourse to make a, a fairly, you know, fair, this is his conclusion. Yeah. They're not the same. So I get that. But I also think that by doing that, he may be missing some of the very important manifestations of this illiberalism today, because websites are yesterday. Yeah. You're saying, however strongly he's making his point, you think it has, it at least is likely to be even stronger. Because there's an aspect of, and I, and I, you know, you could maybe handle this better than me, Chris, but I think I feel like there's an aspect of illiberalism that we've talked about with some other people here about misinformation, about mm -hmm. this sort of epistemological polarization, about this idea that there's a whole world of people out there who are being exposed to a sort of reality that reality-based humans don't see as reality. Right. And I, you know, it's on web pages, sure, but it's it's actually, I think, even more so in a lot of other places. No, All right, Al, if, if Alex Jones, he may have a website, but mostly he was on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Well, first he was on Fox, right? And then he got kicked off of Fox. Well, then he got kicked off. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and QAnon, which is just insidious right now, and which brings a sort of conspiracism into this whole thing that, he, that in the interview anyway, doesn't really talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all on Reddit. Or no, maybe I not even on Reddit anymore. Maybe it moved to something that I don't even know. And, you know, and I was actually trying to think, I mean, you know, there is conspiracism in Senate hearings. The way people talk about Fauci, the way he's questioned, there is the presumption 
at minimum the suspicion and yes. maybe the presumption that he is part of an elite that is not interested in serving the body politic, has his own agenda and is out for power for his own group. And we have to expose this and then destroy it. And that's where, as he argues, that politics comes around to being a war. <laughs> yeah. Where the other side is seen as an enemy, where there is no, there can't be any kind of democratic deliberation. You know, I was really struck. I don't know if this ran during the Super Bowl or if I just saw it on a Twitter as something that was supposed to run during the Super Bowl. But one of the Senate candidates here in Pennsylvania ran an ad that where the basic, not even the tagline throughout the ad was, was this Brandon thing. How does it Let's go, go Brandon. Let's yeah. go Brandon. So essentially, he's bringing into the debate for this Senate race, just basically calling the <laughs> just cursing at the president. Right. What kind of liberal discourse is this? I mean, I'm not sure how one reconciles that with the extent to which liberalism has worked its way into one of the two major political parties. So, I mean, for me to share that sort of optimism, I think would depend somewhat on how a fight that we might see emerging within the Republican Party kind of ends up. I'm not as optimistic as him that the small D Democrats within the Republican Party are going to win. He says that we're in for a rough patch. And, you know, if you call, you know, you could call Guadalcanal a rough patch. <laughs> you know, I mean, it can get very bad indeed. But I think it is correct to say that the political culture of the United States of America is not the same as the political culture of Hungary. On the other hand, you know, Florida is about to pass a law that will basically make it illegal for you to talk about being gay. Yeah, homosexuality. In, yeah. in a classroom. So if uh, part of the point of the Declaration of Independence is that government protects your rights. Right. No. Not, not really seeing it. No, there's no two ways years. about that. It's incorrect, empirically incorrect to belittle or not take seriously the moment that we are in. Because he's right. There's a condition of and a degree and an empowerment of a liberalism that you would have to go back over a century, maybe more, to see, to see its like in American history. And so I think that is a, a really good reason to bring him on the show, to have him write the book, and to talk about these things. So thanks, Jenna, for the interview. And thanks, Michael. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is a collaboration between the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Our editors are Mickey Klein, Chris Kugler, and Mark Stitzer. Editorial review by Emily Reddy. And additional production support from Andy Grant and Chris Allen. If you enjoyed what you heard today, leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. It will help new people find the show. Find more great podcasts about democracy and civic engagement in the Democracy Group Podcast Network at democracygroup.org. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.